Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Heretics of Dune Club, Session 4. That's right, we've made it to Session 4. I'm so excited. And for this session, you need to have read pages 337 through 454 uh, in this mass market paperback. There is a link in the description below, an Amazon link, if you don't have this book and you need it. Although if you're already this deep in the series on YouTube, then I assume you probably have figured out the book situation. But if you haven't, or if you have a different book, the last sentence of the last chapter of this session is, I am almost past the age of breeding, but I am yours to command. That's, that's, that's how I feel every every guy, you know, all the guys I'm, I'm dating, you know. I'm not dating more than one, I'm dating one guy, but that's that's me, you know. <laughs> I've passed the most fast age of breeding, but I'm yours to command. Um, all right. So uh, before the before we get into that, before we get into this, uh, I just want to say that if you're enjoying this Dune Club as much as I am, and you want to support this scene and show all your friends what a cool Dune person you are, you can pick up a final Dune pack on danicaxix.bigcartel.com. You get a really cool sticker sheet that I designed all the stickers and a Marbella cosplay bookmark. And you get some really cool enamel pins that I also designed. I'm very proud of them. And a refrigerator magnet. Uh, so yeah, so check that out uh, on danicaxix.bigcartel.com and support this scene if you feel so inclined. So, oh no, I, oh, we gotta go back over. <laughs> okay, here we go. I didn't fuck up anything. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. All right, so chapter or first sorry hold on i'm a little sick okay i'm just a little i'm a little under the weather but we're doing this we're doing this let's not forget the recap we have a little recap first in this session we ride the worm on rackus and make a break for it on gamu shiana waf and odrade go with shy halud and he drops them off at Seach Tabar, where Odrade discovers Leto's spice hoard and some ancient words of warning that hit her in the core of her being, changing her perspective on the current situation and enters the Bene Gesserit into a hell of an alliance with the Bene Lilacs. Meanwhile, tensions are running high in the Harkonnen no globe on Gamu. Duncan continues to rebuff Lucilla's sexual advances, and Tag tries his best to mediate between these two spicy little weirdos. Um, Burz Burz Molly finally finds the markings that Tag has left behind, and they arrange a rendezvous. And the three finally leave the safety of the no-globe and head right into a firefight where Teg makes his last stand to provide cover for the Gola and the Reverend Mother to escape and is doing a great job until he is hit with a stunner. All right, chapter 25, we go with God. I really uh, also just enjoyed the header of this section. Let me get my little tissue. Excuse me. The header of this section. People always want more than immediate joy or that deep, sense called happiness. This is one of the secrets by which we shape the fulfillment of our designs. The something more assumes amplified power with people who cannot give it a name or who most often the case do not even expect its existence, suspect its existence. Most people only react unconsciously to such hidden forces. Thus, we have only to call a calculated something more into existence, define it and give it shape. And then people will follow. This is a this is a Bene Gesserit lesson, and you know that's the, the something more that they're talking about. It's a little something that you know it's called meaning. Because here's the thing about happiness: like we all want to be happy, right? We all, uh, we in America we have the right to the pursuit of happiness. Being happy is great, whatever. But then, like I've noticed when people have like when they're having all of their needs met. And they have the opportunity, you know, to, they have the reasons to be happy, you know, all these things. It's like, they're still, even if they have everything, it's like, uh, uh, you know, many people are still kind of like, that's not enough. That's not enough. 
And it's because we need to find meaning. And a lot of people uh, are struggling with finding meaning in their lives. And a lot of people find it in a lot of different ways. But it's very important to do that because otherwise somebody will find meaning for you <laughs> and manipulate you with it. So be careful out there. Be careful. So the Bene Lilacs, the Reiki and priesthood, and the Bene Gesserit are in an uneasy alliance that could fall apart at any moment. Sharni, first time, I want to be happy. Yes, well, here's the thing. Instead of chasing happiness, chase meaning, because you're going to suffer in your life. Suffering is a part of life. We're all going to suffer. It's a, it's a punishment banquet to be here, okay? So if you find meaning, it'll make the suffering worthwhile. And then you'll feel happy because you're like, oh, you know, it, mean, it means something to suffer. Like if it, if it doesn't, but whatever, we're, I'm, we're getting off track here. <laughs> JTR got you. Thank you for subscribing. Um, Odrade, Waf, and Shiana are far out uh, in Dar es Balat. This is where they found uh, the God Emperor's recordings, if you remember, from God Emperor Dune Club. And, uh, and Odrade is on a little Bene Gesserit delay mission, since Teg and the Gola are MIA. I mean, Odrade doesn't know that they're not there, but she's like, why has Taraza sent, sent me these, like, nobodies? You know, like, what's going on? And Taraza's just like, just delay, 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 delay. So that's what she's doing. She's going on a little field trip with Waf. And now that the sisterhood knows about the Leilaxu's secret religion and their goal of ascendancy, they are ready to take the bull by the horns. Odrade is keeping a sharp eye on Master Waf, planning to use his great belief to manipulate him into Bene Gesserit control. They leave the safety of the Kanat, and they are walking out into the open desert for Shiana's little demonstration, showing the Reverend Mother and the Master of Masters her power over the sandworms. Shiana is curious as to why she's being asked to do this and is also stoked to uh, show off her skills with Shaitan in front of Audrey, like, check me out. And she's also not stoked to have Waff along. She's like, who is this weird little man? Why is he here with us? Waff is a bit starstruck towards Shiana, you know, the, the minion of his prophet. And he's still super sus of Odraid, thinking she's brought him out here to drain him of his knowledge before killing him. <laughs> but he's like, oh, she's, I was like, I know it. I know she's going to kill me. She's going to try to get my knowledge. She's going to kill me out here. But he's confident in God's grace, knowing that if the Bene Gesserit intentions were hostile, they could not probe him and find out anything. And he would be revived by the, by the Gola process and band along. But if the Bene Gesserit intentions were sincere, and then the Shariat, uh, the Shariat would uh, will ascend at last with a sisterhood acting as their missionaries, and that too will be God's doing. So he's he's prepared for either possibility. Odrade is feeling anxious about Shiana's ability to control the worms. I mean, by herself, yeah. But what will Shaitan do when like other people are around? Because that's never been tested before. Um, looking out into the distance, uh, as they're as they're heading towards the desert she's hit with a warning from her other memories which superimpose the scene of the tyrant's fall over the landscape in front of her and she's able to see where it all went down in ancient history which i thought was so cool like she's just walking and then she's like oh no another memory oh oh no fuck not now and then it's like and she sees into the past and sees where the fairy bridge was where like he tumbled off of it and sees all these people falling off of it it's like ah it's so i thought it was really cool i was really into it i was like what a power um uh, she thinks to herself, why, what is this warning? Like, why am I seeing this right now? Like, she doesn't quite understand what the warning means. Um, and uh, maybe she thinks to herself, is it like when Shiana calls a worm, will that pearl of Leto's awareness, you know, be more aware when it's near the site of his death? Because she's like, I'm, I mean, I can see where he died. So like, Will he, is he going to awaken in there? You know, because that's the sister just really worried that one of these little pearls of awareness within the worm is just going to wake up one day and like Leto's back, you know, and it's like, oh no, you know, like they really, they don't want that to happen. 
Shiana notices Odraid has stopped and asks after her, and the Reverend Mother points out the spot where Shai Halud began. She's like, right over there, that's where he fell. And that's where the Idaho River was, and that's the direction of his palace. And it was torn down a long time ago in the famine times when people were searching for his hoard of spice. And then Shiana tells her that the oral history states that this treasure is hidden in a cave. That is that she knows about this treasure. She's heard about it. Shiana senses a worm and runs out into the dunes and begins her dance with the priests in their thopters above observing all of this. Shaitan comes and Waf is awed at the sight of this messenger of God. Oh my God. Oh, it's my, oh. He's freaking out. He slumps to his knees and bows because no other Leiloxu has ever stood this close to a descendant of the prophet. So this is like big time for him. Odraid is busy storing sense impressions of this whole scene. Uh, data to pass on as other memories if she survives this encounter and she is transfixed by the light of its internal flames she says she describes the mouth of the worm as a cave of mysterious fire i love it's so cool i need to see the fire like in the movies like show me the fire inside the worm i need to see it i we didn't see it last time i'm hoping even though I'm not a huge fan of the Dune movie, the new Dune movie, I'm hoping maybe next time at night we'll see it. I really need to see that fire. Anyways, she is also studying the interactions between the girl and the bees, trying to understand the language between them. Like, how is she communicating with this beast? You know, like, what is going on here? Waf and Odraid follow Shiana up his tail and onto his back behind his mouth, and they all, like, lift uh, the edge of a ring, and they're exposing this, the pulsing pink flesh underneath the hardened exterior which is described as being like plascrete i i love that everything's like plast something you know like plastone or plast like there's all these different things it's like plastic mixed with concrete so it's like super tough and it'll last for thousands of years the girl commands shaitan to go but it hesitates because it's never like this is the second i mean she's asked him other times for a ride and he's like turned her down so she's like oh is this gonna work the worm hesitates but then he lurches into motion and he rides out into the open desert and waff is freaking out he is like we go with god this is the best ride of this little man's life meanwhile odraid is worried that the priests in their thopters overhead might use this opportunity to eradicate the three of them and hopes their curiosity and fear will keep them from violence. She's also wondering, where are we going? Where is this thing taking us? On the horizon directly ahead of them is a place where the tyrant had fallen, the place of the warning from her other memories. A moment of revelation sweeps over her as she understands that the tyrant chose that place to die, and the worm they rode and now moved there of its own volition, drawn to the place where his endless dream began. All right. Pew. On to chapter 26. We are pawns. Let me take a little sip. Take a little sip. Jodo Van Waff is that really loud kid at the amusement park. He is. He's so excited. But he's usually like so serious. It's kind of fun to see him like, you know, get pumped. Back in the no globe, Tag and Duncan have had their, they've been at their present training series for the past 28 days. Idaho is training his new body in the seven central attitudes of combat response against, against attack from eight directions with Tag at the con control console. So eight fucking directions. He's fucking ready. Okay. Meanwhile, a pissed off Lucilla has been skulking about waiting for Duncan to let his guard down so she can imprint on that motherfucker. And Tag is watching this little waiting game uh, with anxiety but knows it's out of his hands. He's like, I, Duncan is no longer a child. <laughs> like, this is like a grown ass man. He's in a child's body, but like, it's a grown ass man now. Still, the old man tries to warn him about Lucilla 
And Duncan just shrugs it off, like, whatever, whatever, dude. Not fucking that hoe. And the Bashar um, has since the Duncan has come to some decision and judgments about the Bene Gesserit, and he's done this on insufficient data. And as a Mintat, you know, he's like, eh, it's maybe not the best way to go. Teg is at a loss as to what he can teach this newly awakened Duncan, while Duncan is still amazed at Teg's resemblance to the Duke Leto. Both physically and spiritually, walking around with that hawk look and that certainty of moral superiority. During a break in their training session, Duncan asks Miles a bunch of questions about his past exploits, and we find out that one time, when the enemy found out that Teg would be facing them at the Battle of Marcon, they sued for peace. They just they knew he was coming. They were like, never mind. We're sorry. Please, never mind. Um, and to this, Teg tells Duncan, reputation can be a beautiful weapon. It often spills less blood. And it's like, ah, oh, Teg is so based. We also find out that at Artel Arbolo, he joined his soldiers on the front lines after incurring heavy losses due to a miscalculation on his part. And he's like, oh my God, we, got, we so many soldiers died because I didn't calculate this correctly. So I'm gonna go to the front lines with them and I'm going to share their burden and show them that like, I, you know what? <laughs> I'm here with you, okay? Like, like I would, and that's just such a, again, boss move. It's just like, you're so cool, Tag. Very dangerous move, but very boss. Um, he also refused to sterilize the whole planet because face dancers were among them, and he chose to take the hard road and weed out the face dancers instead. I mean, they could have just killed everybody, but he was like, no, we'll just find the face dancers and we'll get rid of them, um, which is tough. But, you know, again, he's he took the hard road. And then later, he walked unarmed through enemy ranks before they laid down their weapons. And this move inspired so much loyalty in the enemy that many of them came over to his side in the final assault on Croinen and helped break the anti-sisterhood forces. Teg is the coolest, the coolest, hands down, most based character in Dune, no doubt, like 100. They go back to training. And Duncan's ability to parry an attack is incredible. Uh, and I love that Duncan says, each attack is a feather floating on the infinite road. And as the feather approaches, it is diverted and removed. And I was like, man, that sounds cool. This boy is so fast that Miles can't keep up at the controls and his arm gives out. And Duncan's like, okay, you're old, it's fine. Let's call it, let's totally call it. And the two begin discussing what the Sisterhood's plan for Duncan is on Rackus. Teg truthfully asserts that he really doesn't know and that he suspects that Lucilla doesn't know the whole plan either. Duncan surmises that the Bene Gesserit may have brought him back to confront the worm since he and the worm go way back. He rages as he has raged throughout the centuries about not being anyone's fucking puppet. Then he thinks about Teg and if he's ever been tempted to become a Gola, but then thinks probably not because then he might become a Leiloxu puppet and then a light goes off and he's like, fuck, wait, I am a puppet. I'm a Leiloxu puppet. And he states that the Leiloxu have done something to him which has not been exposed. Lucilla has been creeping on their conversation for a while and she pops out and she's like, that is exactly what we feared. <laughs> Teg is now caught in the middle of a cat fight between the Reverend Mother and the Gola. Dunn controls her by asking, by asking her if she thinks that she will fail in her assignment to fuck him. And she stands tall and is like, mm, you're still a dude. Like, you're still male. Okay, like, let's be real here. And she's thinking to herself, yeah, with a hot young body, just overflowing with those juices of creation. Like, oh, I got you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, Duncan Idaho. She gets spicy with Duncan demanding to know what the Lilaxu have done to him and trying to impress the importance of the game that they are all playing. Then she turns to Teg and gets spicy with him, accusing him of disobeying Taraza. Teg defends himself, telling her that he did exactly what Taraza ordered and that he is her Bashar and that she knows him. <laughs> so she, he is not in trouble. Lucilla hears this truth and the full extent 
of Taraz's maneuvering of this trio hits her and she realized what pawns they are. And what's more, that pawns are expendable. On to our next chapter, chapter 27. The honored Matres have acted. Fuck. We're back for another late night planning session with Mother Superior Terraza in her room on Chapter House. And she's so tired. All oh, this planning. And she uses the 100 heartbeats relaxa relaxation technique taught to her by a failed Reverend Mother from her school days. I thought that her, the 100 heartbeats is really cool. Like she just, like she, like the Bidding Jesuit is so in control of their bodies that she just tunes into her heartbeat and then she just purposefully beats it at a metronome rate, a hundred heartbeats, just to like bring her back to her center when she's feeling really exhausted. And she thinks back on Sister Barham, the sister who taught her this, who was a night proctor who had been barred from the spice agony and sterilized due to a nervous defect that eventually killed her one night. Barham was the first dead person Taraza ever saw, saw and it was before the Bene Gesserit death education called conversations with death and i was thinking i was like we need that like like our our educational system is like so whack in so many ways it's great in certain ways but it's like super whack in other ways and they don't teach you like a lot of stuff that's like really helpful and i feel like having like a death class would be like really good for people like like the, why is there not a class about death you know what i'm saying anyways moving on it takes Terraza a moment to dispel the old memory and return to work, and things are looking so desperate that she's momentarily tempted to play the prescient game, but she doesn't. <laughs> it has been three months, three months since Tag and the gang have gone missing, and there's still no word from them. So she's gone on ahead and ordered another Duncan. She's told the Leilaxu, just like, put another one in the oven for me. This three-cornered alliance between the sisterhood, the church, and the Leilaxu is a delicate thing. The Reverend Mother Superior is shaken out of her worries by the delivery of her nightly tea and gets a little back rub for her, from her acolyte. I was like, man, I wish I had an acolyte. Give me back rubs. That'd be great. Once the girl leaves, Terraza's, Terraza heads for her hard cot for some sleep. But it does not come, and she lays in that in-between state where you're not asleep and you're not awake, and her mind continues to churn and doubts assail her, making her question everything and everyone. She's like, is Teg a traitor? Is Usilla a traitor? <laughs> is Udrey a traitor? She's freaking out. She gives up on sleep and ponders why these lost ones are returning. Uh, were they after the secrets of the axolotl tanks? Were they after Melange? Are they after trying to transplant the worms? Who knows? She hears voices outside her door. Bursmali has returned, but her sleep guard ain't letting him in until Taraza calls out and she says, I'm awake, send him in. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sleeping in here, just let him in. Bursmali has still found no sign of Tag on Gamu and there are no survivors of an attack on the keep on Gamu. Patrin's remains have been identified from two fingers and one eye left from the explosion of his decoy ship. <laughs> I love that they found like two fingers and an eye and they were like, oh, it's him. Shuangyu was found with a mechanical brain probe hole in her skull. But before she died, she left a secret message revealing who was behind the attack. The message simply said, Whores, the honored Matres have acted. They are behind this attack. Taraza sits with Bursmali and asks him to imagine. She's like, you're his favorite student. He knows you really well. You know him really well. Let's imagine that you're Miles. I'm going to interview you, okay? You're Miles right now. And they go step by step, and she leads him through, and they reason out that Tag must still be on the planet. Possibly in a no globe she sends him back to gamu to check out the area where the no ship burns were left under the guise that they are there to place a funeral marker for the old bashar uh, which is like okay so now they can do some recon and they're also suggesting to their enemy that they think that he's dead and before he leaves taraza commands him and his forces to saturate themselves with sheer and if they are caught by one of those new face dancers you better burn your own head or shatter your skull completely 
what an order. Crazy. Men must do God's work. Chapter 28. Shiana, Odrade, and Woff are still riding the worm uh, to Shai Hulud knows where. <laughs> Woff's random bursts of religious fanaticism are wearing on the Reverend Mother. He's like, God will judge us here. I'm so excited. I'm ready to be judged. I love God. And uh, Odrade's like, okay, let God do the judging and not men. All right. And his retort is, men must do God's work. Like, these two going back and forth, like, really crack me up. And Audrey's just like, okay, never mind. Like, she just just shuts up. And she's just like, where the fuck are we going? And are the priests overhead going to attack us? She thinks back on her meeting with Albertus, the senior priest of Dar es Balat, where she used herself as bait for the priests, giving them a potential opportunity to assassinate her in their courtyard. Uh, and I, I loved it when he came up to her and he's like, ooh, you know, and she like thinks to herself, he's got weak bones. <laughs> and I was just like, dude, like, and then she's like, later, she's like, weak bones and weak flesh. Like, it's like, oh, it sucks. Like, God, can you imagine a Benny Gesserit grandma of her mother sitting there thinking you got weak bones in front of her? Oh, um, what a sick burn, too. She opens by putting him to the question and telling him that she almost wishes she had ordered him killed. Albertus, you fucking asshole. And uh, the, the sentence that I chuckled at was, Albertus had entered that fully revelatory phase where fear gripped his scrotum. <laughs> I was like, laugh. I got a good laugh out of that one. The fear, the fear grip. I, I don't have one of those, but I can imagine what that's like. And it made me chuckle. Uh, she then accuses him and his fellow priests of considering whether to kill her and destroy the Bene Gesserit uh, keep at Keen. And he's like, what? No. Oh, we would never. She's like, don't try to deny it. And he's like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. He falls to his knees. He's begging for forgiveness. Audrey maneuvers poor Albertus into confronting the ultimate paradox of all religions that God knows uh, and in the book says the paradox was upon him completely now. God was simply here, but God was usually a long way away and confrontations could be put off. Tomorrow was another day of life. Surely it was. And it was acceptable if you permitted yourself a few small sins, perhaps a lie or two for the time being only, and maybe a big sin if temptations were great. God was supposed to be, or gods were supposed to be more understanding with great sit of great sinners. There would be time to make amends. And I just, I was like cracking up at this too, because it just like reminds me of, you know, like growing up in the church and stuff, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like, ah, you know, I'll sit a little, it's fine. I'll just uh, ask for forgiveness later. It's fine. It's really cute. She commands him to end this farce now. And return to his fellows with her warning that if you do not obey me, if you hinder us in the slightest, your priesthood will not survive. Shiana reveals your every evil thought. And he's just like, oh. And she's trying to restore the one who cares and offers him a great reward in being her messenger or a terrible fate if he fucks it up. He leaves and Odrade is relieved because there were 100% assassins up in the balconies above her and they were just waiting for a signal from old Albertus. Uh, but now, instead, he carries fear back into the heart of the priesthood, which will infect them like a plague. It is called a directed hysteria. And she relaxes knowing the priests will now submit. Only a few immune heretics or to be feared now. More heretics, you know, said the word. They said it. <laughs> On to chapter 29. A damned Bene Gesserit stud. <laughs> Hold on, get comfortable. I also really enjoyed the um, header for this chapter as well. This is the awe-inspiring universe of magic. There are no atoms, only 
waves and motions all around. Here you discard all belief and barriers to understanding. You put aside understanding itself. The universe cannot be seen, cannot be heard, cannot be detected in any way by fixed perceptions. This universe, um, oh wait, no. it is the ultimate void where no preordained screens occur upon which forms may be projected. You have only one awareness here, the screen of the Magi, imagination. Here you learn what it is to be human. You are a creator of order of beautiful shapes and systems, an organizer of chaos. I thought that was nice. It was really nice. It kind of reminded me of, I've talked about it before, of, you know, you have the Kabbalistic tree of life. And if you're going down through the, the lower uh, bit to the supernal triad at the top, you gotta, you know, you gotta cross the abyss. And to cross the abyss, you know, it's like that doth, that knowledge deal and you have to give up all logic and understanding you just have to like pff, you got to go beyond you got to go beyond and uh this reminded me of that of that idea i really liked it um <laughs> yes embrace the chaos yes daiso <laughs> so in this chapter poor miles is caught in the middle of duncan and lucille's contest of wills the two sniping at each other and Teg is like always trying to smooth out the mounting angers between them. He tries once again to warn Idaho of the dangers of resisting the Reverend Mother and asks if she's used the voice on him yet. Duncan says she has tried, but he was able uh, to shrug her off due to his training from Paul Muadib himself. Which I was like, okay, maybe you have a quite like, I don't have the answer to this because this really threw me for a loop. If this is the original Duncan Idaho, then he wouldn't have, like, Paul wasn't Paul Muadib. So then how would he have gotten Paul Muadib to teach him how to, like, shrug off the voice unless he was taken maybe from hate's cells? But, like, but when he first awakened, he awakened as, like, regular Duncan. Like, so I'm a little confused, okay? <laughs> I don't know if anyone, you can tell me the questions and answers if you have an answer for this, but I was like, I don't know. I think it, I think it's a little slip up too. Got in for Lita the second. I know. Um, it's a little questionable. It's a little questionable. I was like, okay. Anyways, moving on. Duncan heads to the showers. Teg stays behind, and Lucilla is in her quarters, stewing about Teg disrupting her mission. Teg, tricky Teg, born of a Redford mother. And the book says, something passed from such a mother to such a child. It began in the womb and probably did not even end when they were finally separated. He had subtle and real powers. Those born of Reverend Mothers learned things impossible to others. So, and Teg's one of, you know, he's got the special sauce. She thinks on how it may have been a mistake not to seduce Teg. And she is definitely attracted to his male presence and wants to get him to that moment of mystery um <clears throat> let's see here and there's another really great little section about the moment of mystery not orgasm no scientific labels it was purest Bene Gesserit can't moment of mystery the imprinter's ultimate specialty she had been taught to believe deeply in a duality the scientific knowledge by which the breeding mistresses guided them, but at the same time, the moment of mystery that confounded all knowledge. I love, I love the calling an orgasm the moment of mystery. <laughs> I think that's great. I think it's really great. I'm into it. Um, <clears throat> so <sighs> she switches her focus. On to Duncan. She's like, okay, I stop thinking about Tug. <sighs> she switches her focus to Duncan and she gathers her sexual forces about her. And she uh, she's getting ready. She wants to teach him those important lessons that he's going to need before going to Rackus. And she's like, what is his problem? Like this idiot, like I have so much hot, fun shit I could teach him. Like he's being such an asshole right now. 
Meanwhile, Duncan is getting dressed in the showers, and I adore the descriptions of the room that he's in with all the arabesques carved on the walls and the ceilings and the tesserae of monsters and human bodies intermingling on the floor and the tile work on the splashboard with script saying, clean, sweet, clean, bright, clean, pure, clean. And then over the door, there's a script that says, confess thy heart and find purity. I was just like, man, this room is cool as fuck. I want to see this room. It is so cool. Lucilla sweeps in and she tries to be smooth with Idaho and she's, you know, he's putting on his little tunic and she like, oh, touches the fabric saying, oh, the Harkonnens. It's such rich tastes. <laughs> Duncan is like, Lucilla, if you touch me again without my permission, I will try to kill you. And I will try so hard that you very likely will have to kill me. And I am not some damn stud for the witches. Lucilla is like, oh, okay, okay. Like, never mind, never mind. She tries another tack, telling the truth. She lets him know that she does not know precisely what Taraza expects of him on Rackus, but that there is a girl named Shiana who the worms obey and the sisterhood want this talent of hers. Teg pipes in from the doorway behind them. It was funny because earlier Duncan and Teg were talking and Lucilla was eavesdropping and then like pops in. And now like the same thing is mirrored and like Teg pops in on Lucilla and Duncan. And he's like, control the worms and you could revive the old religion. They turn around and he's got a laser gun trained on Lucilla. And he's like, this is to make sure you listen to me, lady. And uh, and so he's like, I think that one of the things you were told to do was to make Duncan irresistible to women. Is it because you guys want his human genes for your breeding program? Is that what's going on here? She's supposed to make him a hot stud because that's the thing. You know, I was like. <laughs> I was um what is the name of this there's a Junji Ito it's based off of a novel and it's like a, a manga that he created and like there, it tells the story of this guy and he starts like going to see prostitutes and then like you know he does he gets a lot of his fuck on and he learns a lot of tricks from these ladies and then he talks about how he just has this air of like being good in bed and women just smell it on him you know it's just like they just know he's a rake and like and just like women just like come up to him like it's like magnetizes them to him and so like i was thinking about that with like that's what lucilla is supposed to do to duncan is like train him so that women just like they feel the bde they feel that big dick energy and they're like he this guy fucks i got i gotta get a piece i gotta know um Lucilla asks him, she's like, what do you plan to do with that gun? And he's like, oh, I didn't even put a charge in this. It's not even, it's not even loaded, which is, again, so based and hilarious. I love it. He sets it down and Lucilla is so mad and she threatens to punish him. And he's like, yeah, 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 later. You can punish me later. Bersmali has made contact. He found my messages I scratched. He left a message. I left a message in return. We're arranging a rendezvous. And so right now we got to go upstairs and we got to study these maps of Gamu. Okay, we got to study them real good, and then we're going to have to delete the maps, okay? So, like, we'll just have time for punishment later. And she's like, ah, okay. And so they're getting ready to make a run for it pretty soon. All right, chapter 30. Yeah, map study and chill. Totally talk studios. Back on Rackus, it's dusk and the worm is just now starting to slow down and everyone is mad curious as to where the fuck it is taking them. It pulls up onto the broken remains of the wall around the god emperor's surreal and stops. Shiona tells them Shaitan wants them to get off here and uh, Shaitan will not tell them why he's brought them to this place. Still a bit nervous about potentially being eaten, Odraid and Waff exit Worm and join Shiana at its mouth before it turns and goes back into the desert. The Reverend Mother spies a tall fissure in the rock and goes to investigate with Shiana and Waff in tow. And they find a cave 
And as they explore the mouth of this cave, the sand beneath them gives way and they fall down into a cavern. Uh, and Odrade, once they're down there, she's like, everybody shut up. <laughs> she starts whistling. And like, she's like listening for the echoes to like gauge like the sound of this place, like a bat, you know, she's in like this weird echo location shit. That's so cool. The thopters that were following them land. They call down to make sure they're okay. Um, as they wait for their rescuers to return with some rope, Odrade realizes that they're in a Fremen catch basin where they stored underground water. Using her other memories, she's like, wait a minute. We're in Siege Tabar. Oh my God. We're in Siege Tabar, Stilgar's uh, place and the birthplace of the God Emperor. From above, they are informed, oh, it's going to take us a minute to get the rope, you know, and so they send down some lights to the trio. And Shiana is set up as a guard against Waf, uh, following the Reverend Mother as she explores the ancient Siege indiana jones style so she's like shiana just stay here make sure he doesn't follow me she's like well what do i do you know he's like he fears you okay just tell him this thing and if he said just just tell him god wills it <laughs> like so she's like okay but yeah i love this this indiana jones scene i feel like for sure this has to be inspired by indiana jones this has to be a hundred percent immediately you know, she's walking in here into some caves. She finds some dead bodies and some burn marks on the wall. And then she keeps going. She finds more bodies, more burn marks. And then she finally discovers an enormous chamber where the convocations and the spice orgies of ancient times happened. And it's also where the fish beakers had found a hoard of spice through Duncan's direction. And she's like, oh, wow, you know, like, OK, there's a bunch of spice here. They took it. And she reflects what a bunch of dummies the fish speakers were to have squandered this treasure, especially during the famine time. She's like, you just a briefcase of this stuff. You could buy a whole planet. And then now they were just such idiots that they blew it all somehow. And then now, like, they have to, like, remain with the protection of Ix. Like, ugh, stupid. She follows her sense of danger like a beacon and trips on an uneven spot. Looking at the floor, she sees the word Arafel burned in flowing script. Arafel, a.k.a. the cloud darkness at the end of the universe, a.k.a. the tyrant's holy judgment, a.k.a. the cloud darkness of holy judgment. So this is it, guys. <laughs> she thinks... Did the fish bakers find all of the hoard? Like, was this all of Leto's hoard? Arafel, which means, you know, at the end of the universe, she's like, thinks, hmm, okay, end of the universe. She looks up, she sees this dome where the universe has been painted, the heavens have been painted, and she finds the sunset marker. Uh, because Fremen Day starts at night, you know, so the edge of the universe is beyond the setting sun. And she she looks, there's a passage to the left of the sunset marker. She goes in there, and then there's, like, another room to the right, like, directly behind the marker. And she's, like, in it. She's, like, oh, my gosh, the, the room is thick with the smell of melange. And her danger sense is so high that she says uh, the litany against fear as she searches the room. And she finds an etching, an ancient Jacobs, Jacobsa. Yeah, Jacobsa. I did it. And it says here. But like here is in like, you found me. She tries to push the threshold. She's like, how do I open this? And then uh, she's pushing. Nothing happens. Uh, she's frustrated. She kicks at the word. And uh, and then it moves. <laughs> you know, it's like I love I love this. You know, you always see that where it's like, oh, what do I do? Uh, and then they like kick something, and then like, oh, and then it works. Or they throw something, and it's like, oh, then it works. It was so cute. I thought that was a really nice little moment. Um, comedic, comedic, if you will. Uh, once more, the ground gives beneath Odrade, and she's sucked down into a giant chamber. But this one is filled with melange filled huge huge room lots of melange 
And she uh, and she notices too. She looks back. She's like, "Why did nobody ever find this place?" And she looks back and she sees rock bracings where if anyone was tapping, because the people would tap and they'd be like, "Oh, it's empty back there." But there were these bracings that would make it to where it just sounded like there was like solid rock back there. So that's why nobody ever found it. And as she's looking around, she sweeps her light across a wall and she sees a message. It says, "A Reverend Mother will read my words." It's happening. I bequeath to you my fear and loneliness. To you, I give the certainty that the body and soul of the Bene Gesserit will meet the same fate as all other bodies and all other souls. Fuck. <laughs> Leo's talking to you right now. What is survival if you do not survive whole? Ask the Bene Lilacs that. What if you no longer hear the music of life? Memories are not enough unless they call you to noble purpose. Bitch. Why did your sisterhood not build the golden path? You know the necessity. Your failure condemned me, the god emperor, to a millennia of personal despair. Fuck you. My words are your past. My questions are simple. With whom do you ally? With the self-idolaters of the Bene Lilacs? With my fish speaker bureaucracy? With the cosmos wandering guild? With Harkonnen blood sacrificers? With a dogmatic sink of your own creation? How will you meet your end as no more than a secret society? Psh, this sucks. <laughs> He's teaching him lessons. Olita is teaching him lessons from 3,500 years ago. She understands the tyrant's meeting behind this word, these words. He's saying, join me. Join me on this golden path, baby. Odrade finally sees the pattern of Taraz's design, uh, which joins Leto in his golden path and wonders at Taraz's wisdom. The, the sisterhood could no longer play it safe in the old Imperium. They must be willing to sacrifice themselves and fundamentally change slash evolve and go into the worlds of the scattering to ensure the golden path continues, which is the ultimate survival and maturation of the human race through diversification and immunity to potential prescience. Or they could keep their old ways of security and die as a secret society. Who cares? Evolve or die, Bene Gesserit. <laughs> Join me. Uh, all right, let's go on to our next chapter. They Want Us Alive, chapter 31. I know, Davy Alito. Lita the second is still blowing minds 3,000 years later. I know. <laughs> I know it's true. Okay, here we go. Back on Gamu. It's been a little over a week, and it's go time. Tag and Duncan and Lucilla are armed with laser guns and ready. They leave the no globe into the snowy, cold night, which sucks. Because now they're going to be leaving tracks all over the place in the snow. And Tag's even thinking, like, are there traitors in weather management like this? Like, what the fuck is this snow right now? Bursmali is running late. Tag and Lucilla argue while Duncan listens to the night. And all of a sudden, great bursts of rumblings erupt all around them. There's a battle going on. There's no ships landing in the valley below, and it is too late to go back inside the globe. Glow globes are let loose into the air, and they can see face dancers moving upslope towards them. They hear a shout from above, Bashar! Not knowing for sure, because it could be a trick. He didn't know, but he's like, well, we don't really have a lot of options here. So not knowing if it's if it's Burr's Molly above them or not, he commands Lucilla and Duncan to make a run for it uphill. Duncan hesitates, knowing that Teg is about to sacrifice himself to buy the pair time to get to safety. Teg notices his hesitation and tells him, this is a battle order. I am your commander. He just... And this is the closest thing to voice Lucilla has ever heard from a man. Yes. He's so cool. <laughs> He's so cool. They run, and Teg is ready to fuck up the advancing attackers with a little of the old unexpected. 
He sets his laser gun to maxi beam and sweeps a fiery arc across the slope below him. Cue carnage and screaming. And then he hits him again with another blast. And he's like, nobody's firing back. And he realizes it's because they want them alive. He hits them again with a couple of short bursts while he finds a better vantage point. Then he hits him again, this time letting them see the laser gun fade out as it loses its charge, making them think that the laser gun is dead and that he's fleeing uphill. He waits as the remaining face dancers and their masters come closer, and then boom, <laughs> hits him again with his second laser gun on maxi beam until this one peters out. Uh, making his surviving attackers far more cautious of coming up the hill and perhaps giving him enough time to join Duncan and Lucilla. He goes to make a run for it and bam, he gets hit by a stutter. It's lights out for Miles Tech. <sighs> What's going to happen? <sighs> we have to wait and see. All right, chapter 32. I have such authority. <laughs> yeah, it was a stunner from the place he sent Lucilla and Duncan. Yes. Yes. So, who knows? We'll have to find out. Oh, my God. <clears throat> um, back in the Bene Gesserit keep on Rackus, Adraid is mentally preparing herself for another round of negotiations with Waff. Uh, I also, I enjoyed the description of the black furnishings in which a robed reverend mother might blend with only the lighter shades of her face visible to the visitor and i was like oh that's so cool you're sitting in this chair and it's just like you just blend into this chair and your robes and they just see your face like oh that's so intimidating it's really cool she's thinking to herself have i gauged this little guy correctly is he ready to crack I've been feeding those doubts, but I don't know yet. She faces away from him, looking upon the city of Keen, and lets him stew a bit while being flanked by two guardian sisters. As she takes in the city below her, she contemplates all the modernization of this quarter of the city and what it means, how it's a symptom of the planet losing touch with its past, power seeping away from traditional power structures, how the cycle of modernization will show up in the church, you know, we want shorter, more upbeat rituals, new songs in a modern manner, changes in the dancing that so it's not so fucking long, fewer ventures into the dangerous desert for the young postulants from the powerful families, society further watering itself down, which I mean, it happens. I mean, I was again, I was in church and I saw that happen where they like had the traditional thing. And then eventually they started doing like the more modern, you know, worship service with a band and like they're playing stuff you know like it is it was, but my dad wouldn't let me go to that he's like no you have to go to the boring one and i was like oh please um <laughs> her mind goes to the new face dancer tuick and how utterly convincing he is and wonders how different these new face dancers are and like how close are they to being fully human because she's like looking at him he's like this guy's like really good like he seems legit like, I know he's a face dancer, but, like, this guy is, like, you know, he's doing the thing. She also thinks on her failure to restore the one who cares in her new priestly minion, Albertus, and has instead created a groveling sycophant. The book says, Odrade had never before focused on how easily the Missionaria Protectiva's teachings destroyed human independence. That was always the goal, of course. Make them followers, obedient to our needs. This thought triggers the memory of the tyrant's haunting words. I bequeath to you my fear and loneliness. With whom do you ally? Are you no more than a secret society? How will we meet our end? In a dogmatic stink of our own creation? It was interesting because in this chapter, it says dogmatic stink of our own creation. But in the chapter before, it says dogmatic sink. So there's a typo there. I found one. I found a few typos. I should I should have written all these down and then just like sent them to the publisher. <laughs> I don't think they'll do anything with them. But, um, you know, and she thinks to herself, where is the noble purpose in what the sisterhood does? You know, she's just like, uh, she's really feeling those words. Audrey has thought long enough. 
And now it's time to have at the little Tleilaxu. The little Tleilaxu. She opens by asking him for his answer and their proposed alliance. And he responds upset that he feels like he has the lower hand in this matter and he is being forced into it. He feels like he's he's in a corner. He doesn't like it. Odrade quotes his scriptures back to him. Man is but a pebble dropped in a pool. And if man is but a pebble, then all his works can be no more. <laughs> and when she says these words to him, she shudders involuntarily. And why does she do this? Why does she shudder? Because she was just thinking about how gross it is using religion to manipulate humans into being subservient little creeps. You know, she's like, ugh, you know, we're taking their independence away from them. We're not strengthening humanity. We're, we're turning them into little sycophants. I hate it. And here she is doing the very thing that she just like was thinking about being disgusting. And B, because she hears the import of her words and she's applying them to herself in the sisterhood. You know, it's like the sisterhood is but a pebble dropped in a pool. And so all of their works can be no more. You know, how small they are in the greater scheme of things. Once again, the tyrant's words come back to her. The body and soul of the Bene Gesserit will meet the same fate as all other bodies and all other souls. And this is hitting her hard, extra hard, because Teraza had made her vulnerable to them when she had her write the highly charged Atreides Manifesto, which stirred that age-old Atreides morality within her. Okay, Atreides, like, you can't control the Atreides. They have their own morality. And they, that's what they listen to. They don't give a fuck. And it's just like, you. she like built this up in Odrade and it's like coming on her. And she's like hearing this stuff and she's like, oh God, oh, my, my Atreides morality is surfacing. Oh, it's overtaking my, my Bene Gesserit training. The two go back into negotiations with Waff warning her that they have mad weapons that they don't even know about. And that we are prepared to use them. Okay, we will. We are prepared for violence. And she's like, look, I, we know. <laughs> like, we do not doubt that. And she tells them the truth that a war between them is exactly what their mutual enemies would love to see. And how they would swoop in to destroy both of them after they had weakened each other. Waff sees the truth in this. But it's like, look, I get it. But we need a better deal. And he asks her if she has the authority to negotiate, really negotiate. Audrey tells him, I have such authority, which she does and she doesn't. Taraza did say that you are on the scene and know what is needed, but the wild independent Atreides actions she's about to take are going to bum Taraza and the rest of the sisterhood out. But now that she's taken authority, Taraza has to go along with whatever Odrade decides. This is a huge power move, but she's not doing it to grab power for herself. She's doing it for the betterment of humanity and for the betterment of the sisterhood. Now the game is really on. She offers him a seat and they get settled to get down to business. Waff is still sus for Bene Gesserit tricks and Odrade ventures a gamble, telling him, this is no Poinda female talking to you right now. And Waff is, is shook by these words, but he's still not convinced. She makes it clear that they don't have anything to gain. The Bene Gesserit don't have anything to gain from exposing the, the Leilaxu's secret religion or exposing their new face dancers or exposing how they have Ix and the fish speakers under their control with these said face dancers and proposes to even the playing field by revealing Bene Gesserit's secrets to Waff, such as their plot to plant the worms of the prophet on uncounted planets of the scattering, a thing the Reikian priests would do anything to prevent. Waff is pleased. He's like, okay, that's some tea. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but he wants her to send her guardians away so that they can talk in private, private. And she acquiesces. Now they're alone, and to assure him that no secret listeners are spying on them, they begin to speak in the ancient Islamiat language, 
which causes a change in Waff. His personality shifts into one of confidence and he becomes far more open. She tells him more secrets about how the schism of the sisterhood is from dissenters who have broken away from their great belief and fear that they may bring back another Quisette's Hatterack and restore the prophet on Rackus. <laughs> and I love how she's like, God wouldn't, God would not send the same message twice. And Waff's like, this is true. <laughs> like, I think that, that, that was really cute between them. Waff tells her that the honored Matres rule with sex. And Andrade's like, she reveals the fallacy of such an action and how it will be their ultimate undoing. She goes on to tell him that those Leilaxu descendants that have returned to them from the scattering are puppets of the honored Matres, and unless their factions unite in a common plan to defeat them, they will both be chewed up the way a slig chews up its dinner. Waff's like, all right, well, what's the plan? What's your plan? Odrade gambles. Exactly what you plan to do. Let's convert them. We're going to convert them. When you say the word, the sisterhood will openly espouse the true faith. Waff sits in a stunned silence and wonders if she knows how they plan to enforce their conversion. So she ventures an even further gamble on that issue. Because again, she doesn't know for sure that this is the plan, but they're fairly certain. Um, but she's just, she keeps it vague enough. You know, she she makes another gamble, keeps it vague. What you have achieved with your golas from your tanks and kept secretly for yourselves alone, others will pay a great price to achieve. So that is the heart of the Lilaxu plan to ascendancy. They offer, they are going to offer a kind of immortality to those who espouse the true faith. You convert, you can, you too can live forever and we'll keep you going with the golas. I mean, that's a really great, I mean, I think that's, you know, a good bargaining chip for them in their plan for ascendancy. And he's like, oh my God, oh, she knows. Will you demand a share in that as well? And she says, everything. We will share everything. Everything, babe. W ask, what do you want? What do you want from us? He's like, all your breeding records, they are yours. Breeding mothers of our choice, name them. He's like, ah, oh, ah, oh. <laughs> he's freaking out. Uh, and he's like, well, you, you'd want some unrestricted melange in return, right? And she's like, yeah, totally. Uh-huh. Waff's head is spinning. He has just gained the services of the most powerful and enduring missionary force in his crusade to spread the great relief. Odrade names their accord Noble Purpose. Cute. She tells him even more secrets that they plan to breed Shiana with Duncan and that their descendants who will be able to control the worms will go out onto all the scattered worlds where they're going to plant those worms. And, uh, and they're also going to plant that great belief. And then they're going to gain massive religious control. I mean, they're like pulling like a Duncan Siona part two. Because remember, they, you know, Duncan and and Siona bred together. And then, you know, I guess it's because he's got those pure ancient human genes that like the, I don't know, the the Siona, you know, nobody can detect me prescience, like isn't hindered or fucked up by that for some reason. So they're hoping the same thing's going to happen with Shiana, where it's like, oh, we'll breed him with him. And then they're going to have all these babies and these babies are going to control these worms. It's going to be great. Um, and, uh, Waff is secretly like, oh my God, we have the upper hand because the Gola is on our side. It's not on your side. Oh my God, this is such, oh, yes, I love this bargain. And to add the cherry on top of their alliance Sunday, he asks if the Bene Gesserit will help him spread this Atreides manifesto. And she's like, why not? I wrote it. And he's, he's like, I I'm a true descendant of the Atreides. He's like, oh my God. Would you be one of our breeders? And she says, I am almost past the age of breeding, but I am yours to command. And that's it for session four. Wow. For session five, you need to read pages 455 through 561, or until you get to the sentence, the field marshal would not be able to tell this dangerous female anything really important. All right. All right. Yay.
That's really exciting. What a wonderful session. <laughs> what a fantastic session, everyone. Thank you for joining me for Dune Club yet again. I'm so excited to have you on this journey. This has been fantastic. And uh, we're going to go to some questions and answers on twitch.tv slash Danica XIX. I will see the rest of you YouTubers next week with session five. <laughs>